welcome to the Ward 2 City Council Candidates Forum, uh, hosted by the League of Women Voters of the Northampton area. My name is Ingrid Flory, and I'll be moderating tonight's forum. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the League of Women Voters, uh, we are a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. I'd like to give a special thanks to NCTV for recording tonight's forum um, and making it available to the public. They'll be broadcasting at a later time and also it'll be available online on their website at northamptontv.org. So I would also like to thank both of tonight's candidates. We have Paul Spector and Jason Foster. Thank you for coming and agreeing to, um, to help inform our citizens so they can make a good choice come um, in a couple weeks. Uh, tonight, uh, we will, we're going to begin our, op our evening with opening statements from both candidates. Uh, then we have questions that have been uh, submitted in advance to the league, which I will be uh, presenting to the candidates. And then uh, we will have um, volunteers walking up and down the aisles collecting uh, questions from the audience. So if you'd like to pose a question, please write it down as succinctly as possible so that we can get through as many as we in our time allocated. And uh, also, each candidate will have the opportunity to answer every question. So please phrase your question accordingly so that every question is directed to both candidates. So. Uh, of course, we will do our best to sort through the questions so that they don't duplicate each other so we can cover as many issues because I know there's a lot of them out there. Um, and of course, uh, we expect you all to ask questions that are uh, respectful to both candidates and res that, uh, that represent the concerns of many citizens. So um, please uh, do hold your applause until the end of the, the forum so that Again, we have time to get through as many questions as possible. So we flipped a coin a little while ago, and uh, Paul will be beginning with the opening statements. Thank you. And we have, you see you have your, your prompts there <laughs> in the front row. Tell me when I can start. Yes. <laughs> you may go right ahead, Thank please. Thank you. I am very honored to be your city councilor, and I've earned your trust through a number of elections. And I'm, I'm proud of my record. I also want to start by saying I'm very proud that I've been part of the leadership team through both the Higgins administration and now with David Narkowitz as mayor. This has been, the last 10 years, um, some of the toughest economic times for cities and towns all across the Commonwealth. And I truly believe that we have been very lucky to have two very good leaders, and I'm happy that I was part of that. I mean, I don't know how many of you know of any other towns as vibrant and as alive and as diverse as Northampton in all of New England, and that has as good a Moody's bond rating as we have. So I ask for your support again, and I do so for a number of reasons. One is my work as an organizational consultant and as a mediator I think has helped me tremendously. I think it's a good fit in terms of being a city councilor and working in local government. Because when you work in government, you have to learn how to collaborate, develop relationships, build teams, build partnerships. And I think I've been able to do that quite successfully. <clears throat> I think one of the things I've done the last few years is try and build more civility on the city council. If you remember a few years ago, we didn't have that. And um, I think I've been quite successful because I think we've been more productive because of that. And in fact, uh, Councillor Bill Dwight, who's the president of the council, who endorses me in his endorsement, he said that I am the um, thoughtful, leavening counselor. I think that was a positive thing he said about me, but I'm not quite sure. And it's been through collaboration and teamwork a lot of things happen. For example, we set the stage a number of years ago for zoning, made zoning changes through partnerships that has been the stage that's been set for a recent boom in commercial development, which is really added to our tax base. It's also been through building partnerships that we were able to reinvigorate the Energy Commission which as you know, you've probably seen the success of Solarize Northampton, but also something you might not see, which is that we went and did a real green conservation project on all of our buildings throughout the city. It's been amazing. We are gonna save tens of thousands of dollars over the next decade because of that. Probably even more importantly on the ward level, the ability to forge partnerships, work collaboratively and collectively is really where the answers are, whether it's at the YMCA, 
or traffic calming on Elm Street or the, the, uh, the section at Jackson Street and Woodlawn and finding solutions. Finally, I think that my values as a progressive align very nicely with this ward. I think six years ago, I came to all of you, we had meetings, I think it was six years ago, and we talked about the CPA, the Community Preservation Act, and you were the ones who encouraged me to get the Community Preservation Act on the ballot, and you said, try and get it enacted. It costs money, but yes, it's aligned with our values of open space, of affordable housing, and that was a quick three minutes, and thank you very much. <laughs> I was about to say I couldn't actually see the monitor, but I saw that quite well, thank you. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this debate and because they were part of my inspiration to run for office. Through my mother's years of involvement as a board member in Connecticut, I was exposed to activism and how becoming involved, you can have a positive impact on your community. I'm often asked, why am I running? Because I'm a concerned citizen our city has been facing declining revenue and increased expenses for nearly a decade, leading to multiple overrides, higher taxes, and a multitude of other problems. It's time to take a different path by being proactive and creative. We deserve choices, not pass this override or our children's education suffers. I voted yes, but with much frustration. Our elected officials are unable to create new revenue generating ideas, income that is not dependent on higher taxes or the hope of more state aid. We'll be paying another new tax next year, this time to address the stormwater drain shortfalls. Now is the time to elect someone who has the credentials and the skills to help our, to help our, our city through these challenging times. Someone like me. I'm also ask, often asked, how am I different than my opponent? After all, we both agree on many issues and have socially progressive agendas. However, I have over 20 years of successful business experience as an entrepreneur. In 1991, after earning a finance degree, I was faced with the reality of a recession. There were no jobs, I had no income, no resources, substantial student loans, and an unorthodox plan for my future. While most of my classmates headed to graduate school, in the aftermath of Tiananmen Square, in 1991, when few people were considering China, I took a different path. I headed to Beijing. At 25, I co-founded a pioneering business that evolved into one of the most successful market research companies in Shanghai. It started with a vision, $500, tireless persistence and the will to accomplish my goals. Within five years, we had achieved 110 employees, four offices, and a list of Fortune 500 clients. As a resident of Round Hill Road, my neighbors and I have been dealing with the reality of the Clark School development by Opal, one of the largest in Ward 2. Many of us have been frustrated with our lack of representation. We're concerned about our quality of life, even when we've had a chance to speak at public meetings, our voices felt dismissed, as if decisions were already made and we had no choice. That's not acceptable. I believe with new proactive leadership and a fresh perspective, the residents of Ward 2 would be better served. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I now have some questions that were submitted in advance to, to the League that I'll be asking each candidate will have a chance to respond um, since, since Paul went first for the opening statements. Uh, Jason, the first question will be, you'll have the first opportunity to answer the question. Um, so specific to Ward 2, what, what in your opinion are, the, are three of the most pressing issues in your ward at this time and how a city councilor will you address those issues? Well, <clears throat> I think that's a great question and it's not, I wouldn't say in, in my opinion, it's actually in the resident's opinion so from uh, the various people that I've spoken with throughout the entire ward, on the west side of Smith, on the south side of Smith, um, the number one issue across the ward is speeding. And the number two issue is the hope to avoid future overrides. And I believe that the best way to address both of those is with some proactive leadership. 
Um, the third issue, and this is also a very big one, is representation and dealing with large developments like Village Hill, Round Hill Road, Smith College, and the YMCA. And from my perspective, the best way to address speeding is to heighten awareness, create some kind of educational process so that people that are using the streets to speed or go faster than they should, they should know that there's families, there's children, it's, it's a neighborhood. And hopefully we can reduce speeds by just heightening awareness and organizing and having a lot of follow up and follow through, possibly reducing speed limits and it may come down to enforcement as well. In terms of representation at large developments, it's important for the residents that are affected to have a voice and to make sure that they're not being dismissed at meetings because, you know, I've, as someone who's been on Round Hill Road and dealing with the Clark School development, um, it seems as if our concerns aren't always addressed and it's frustrating. And in terms of um, overrides, I believe that the best way to address that is with some business experience. You know, I have over 20 years of business experience and I believe I can enhance the skill set of the current city council because if we don't do something to enhance that skill set, I think we'll continue to have overrides as a band-aid solution rather than long-term solutions to create sustainable revenue for Northampton. That's not dependent on tax or hope of more state aid. Okay, thank you. Same question to you, Paul. Would you like me to restate yes, it? Yes, I would love to restate <laughs> the question. What, in your opinion, are the three most pressing issues in your ward at this time? And how, as city councilor, would you address those issues? Well, I think, first of all, one of the most interesting things is it, it shifts depending on what street you're on. So right now on Washington Street, there's been a lot of concern about events on the Mill River. That includes a number of things, which is uh, issues around dogs, which we just saw recently. Maybe we'll talk more about that later. Issues around people camping out during the summer and vandalism in that area. And also issues about are, is the vastly increased traffic in there, that area somehow creating environmental problems. So that's in the, Mill, in the Mill River area. Then around the YMCA, immediately around that, you got people saying, it's the issues of the why, which I think we've now resolved after a few years. I think overall that the budget issues, I think Jason is right, that the budget issues are on everybody's mind. I think we're just turning a corner that just last week the economic development um, officer announced that we are gonna have a kind of historic year here in terms of new development. Probably most of you know that if you drive down King Street and all of that development going on, and that took a lot of planning. I happen to be the chair of the Economic Development Committee, and we've been putting this planning in effect for six years. We've been changing zoning a little bit to make commercial development um, in places where it's most appropriate, and it's now paying off. In fact, I mentioned the Moody's bond thing, which I never thought I'd be into bonds and bond rating, but it means a lot in terms of how we borrow money. That rating from Moody's, which is a very good rating, came to us because of our economic plan. They said, this is a good plan. So that budget thing where we're gonna get revenue is a big concern for people in the city. Also, how we're making cuts. One of the things we've done recently, and the reason I think you have supported overrides, is because you know we work as hard as we can. We look at every possible way of getting revenue. We've saved, a and making cuts, we've saved a million dollars a million dollars by supporting the mayor's negotiation for health care costs for this city, which one is, is one of the highest costs we've had. We've also saved, as I mentioned earlier, tens of thousands of dollars on, on green conservation. Thank you very much. Uh, this will be directed at you, you. first again. <laughs> um, and, and you guessed it. Uh, there's been renewed debate in the Daily Hampshire Gazette about whether or not dogs should continue to be allowed to run unleashed in this state-owned land. I know, it's a hot topic on the south and west side of the Mill River near the former state hospital. How would you approach this problem and how important is it to you to solve it? Uh, it I think it's very important to solve it. First of all, transparency. I have a big, beautiful golden retriever. I think everybody here would love my dog. My dog runs free on the Mill River. I feel like my dog would never do anything to anybody. And a few weeks ago, and this is what instigated this again, a person in our ward was knocked over by a dog just like mine and had a very serious injury. That restarted this conversation. I know and I see her here tonight that Fran Volkman, our former city councilor, I believe right before I became councilor, you had a big meeting about dogs. So this issue comes up again and again. I also want to say that Ward 2 has more dog owners, I believe, than any place else in the world. So with all of that said, there are two concerns here, and that's why it's not about what I think is the solution. 
what Jason thinks is the solution. We need to come together again as a community to discuss this. There have been some new ideas about this. Should we have certain times when people can come with their dogs? That may be one way we go. The other thing that we need to understand is that the other side, what they call the dog park, that is state land that is leased to Smith folk for agricultural purposes. Well, folks, guess what? When you walk your dog, you're trespassing. When you play Frisbee, you're trespassing. When you go jogging there, you're trespassing. It's supposed to be agricultural uses. So you know what Smith Volk doesn't want to do? They don't want to open this can of worms. It's a very complex situation. I think we need to have a community meeting about this, and it's not just our ward. This is a citywide issue. Um, so that's, I, I was hoping to avoid the whole question of dogs, but I kind of knew it was going to come up. Um, so thank you on that. OK, thank you. Jason, would you like me to read the question again? Sure. There's been a renewed debate in the Daily Hampshire Gazette about whether or not dogs should continue to be allowed to run unleashed in the state-owned land on the south and west side of the Mill River near the former state hospital. How would you approach this problem, and how important is it to you to solve it? Well, first of all, it's important because the person that was injured did email me and ask me um, my opinion, let me know that there was going to be a letter to the Gazette explaining what happened. And I think it's a great example of how perhaps my opponent and I may differ slightly. Um, I think, just the short answer is I think that dogs should have a place to run free. I think it's a big part of the Northampton culture, and I think it's something that we should um, encourage. One of the issues that the person who was injured, and I'm glad to hear that she's recovering, was she talked to animal control and various other departments, and their response was the best solution is to put up a fence, which makes sense to me. I think that's uh, a very logical solution. And obviously, you'd have to go through the different departments to make sure that that, in fact, can be done. And, um, but then the next real issue was, well, how do you pay for it? Because that seemed to be a big concern. And I think it sounded like the response that she immediately had was, well, there's just no money. It's too expensive. And I thought that's a perfect example of how being proactive can solve a problem. So I thought, well, I myself do not have a dog, but I do know a lot of people that do. And I think that um, there could be a really interesting way to finance this by approaching people that are dog lovers and do have animals um, about how about contributing to build a fence. And maybe you can have for a certain denomination, whether it's $50 or $100 or more, um, a memory on a fence to honor your pet or a lost, you know, lost or deceased animal. And I think that with the right marketing, with the right drive, with the right follow through, you can actually raise the funds from volunteer citizens who want to enjoy their pets, put a, a beautiful fence uh, in a very large area, and allow animals to run free. But I think it's about being proactive and making sure that we find solutions, rather than, well, it's a complex issue. Of course it's complex, but there's ways around it with the right persistence. Thank you. Um, this question, again, gets uh, back to you, Jason. So. Um, what are your, what specific ideas do you have uh, for areas to cut expenses in the city budget? And conversely, what are your specific ideas for generating new revenues for the city? Well, that's, <clears throat> that's a loaded question. And uh, I'll start with the budget piece. So um, right off the bat, you know, I was, I was studying the budget. And I do think the city's done a nice job of reducing expenses. And for the record, I don't think there's a lot of fat in the budget. But I do think there are areas where we can reduce. Number one, I noticed that we're spending $77,000 a year on postage. And I just feel that maybe we could look at becoming a little more electronic in terms of our communication with citizens. Not everyone, but we may be able to go on a certain initiative to reduce that expense. But the largest expense is the $16 million a year we're spending on health care benefits. And I think the mayor's done a nice job of reducing costs as much as he can. But I have a, an idea uh, to reduce costs in the healthcare area by trying to shift some of the public costs into the private sector. Because um, there's certainly going to be a high percentage of people that are on the city's healthcare plan that have access to other healthcare through their spouse um, that are in private sector. And perhaps that the healthcare plan that the city offers is slightly better and maybe a slightly reduced cost to the people that are on it. In some instances, what happens if we offered an incentive to people to not go on a health care plan? This worked for me in China when we had 110 people in a very socialist economy where we actually offered employees an option. Either you can participate in a health plan, which we're happy to provide, or if we offer you, let's say, $1,000 a year, 
perhaps you would opt out of the health plan and you get to keep the, the, the money. It saved us a great deal of money and the employees were happy. It was a win-win for everyone. In terms of revenue generating ideas, I'd like to see a renewable energy park placed on the landfill and I think that could be a great revenue stream for the city that is not dependent on tax or state aid. It's self-sustaining revenue for Northampton, which I'd like to comment further, but I'm out of time. Okay, thank you. So let oh. me jump in first on the, on the solar park. I totally agree. In, in fact, I've been the leader on that. About four years ago, um, I brought in both a, a couple of solar companies, including Northeast Solar, to take a look and do some studies of what we could do there. Once the landfill is closed, uh, the landfill is not closed yet, folks, officially, in terms of engineering standards, and we have to wait until it settles. So that is a, a very good idea. We're going to have a large uh, photovoltaic uh, site there. We will get about somewhere between 150,000 to 200,000, which is not chump change, but you know, on an 80 million or something so budget, it's just a, a small piece. One of the problems with revenue is that the state, this is this liberal state of Massachusetts. To me, liberalism is you allow people and communities to come up with solutions. That would be my definition. This state is extremely prescribed in terms of what you can do for revenue. They do, <laughs> I see the former mayor nodding there and a former counselor nodding. They tell you exactly what you can do for revenue. And they have such strict laws about what you can do and can't do. That it really ties your hands. So we did institute, and I supported this and helped lead this through, through creating some teams on the, and to look at this, a hotel tax and a meal tax, which was one of those things they allow us to do. Currently, we're looking at a pilot program, which occasionally the state will say, you can go ahead and try this, a pilot program so that Smith College actually pays some taxes. We are waiting until the new president comes in, because we've got to get kind of them to come on board with this, but so that we can have a kind of predictable income. Now let me just go back to the dogs briefly, because I want to say this, because I see some folks here from along the Mill River, and they'd say, how come he didn't say this? Along the Mill River, much of that is private land, just so you know. Along, again, where the dog park is, that is state land. And again, you start getting involved with the state, and I don't like this as much as a lot of people, the way the state says what you can do and what you can't do. But we would have to then say this is agricultural purpose only as far as the state concerns. So I'm not sure they're going to let us put up a fence, although I think it's a good idea. All right, thank you. Um, so I have one more question prepared, and then I'd like to um, respond to some of the, uh, pose some of the questions that have been collected from the audience. So if you, if you have a question, please pass it down to the end of the line with, the, with one of our volunteers. Um, all right, so this, this goes to you Comes first, to Paul. Yep. Um, how does a counselor okay. balance being responsive to constituents with being a team player with fellow counselors and the mayor? That's a great question. Um, I think one of the things I've valued is building relationships, but, and that's both with the residents of the ward. It's also, I think I've earned the trust of this mayor and the past mayor the council president, especially you have to earn the trust of people who work for this city. And, they're, and they're re you have to treat them very respectfully because that's who you're working with all the time. And the fact is that you have to be capable then of treating them very civilly and respectfully and diplomatically. Quite frankly, you build those relationships and that trust through that. Let me just say one thing that, you know where the rubber really hits the road on cuts? It's with our city employees who have not really seen a real raise in almost 10 years. We just haven't been able to do it. At times, I am amazed at the quality of the people we have working for this city and that they stay here. And they stay here because they love working here. So one of the things you need to do is you need to look at, I'm kind of forgetting your question, but I think I'll uh, keep going there, is that we, you need to develop those relationships, and I believe we have, and develop that trust. And so when we have problems, on a ward level, I'm able to call up someone at DPW and have a conversation with them, get the things I need, understand the processes that are in place. So that is the main way that I believe you, you go about establishing trust both on the ward level and with people who work for the city and, and with the constituents. And by the way, I have the endorsement of the current mayor. Now the current mayor, I just want to say this, is like an Eagle Scout to me. You know, I mean, he's amazing. He is an Eagle Scout. He, he tells the truth all the time. He does incredible research. 
And he has actually said that I am one of the most effective counselors and a counselor he can turn to and trust. Thank you. Um, how does a counselor balance being responsive to constituents with being a team player to, with fellow counselors and the mayor? Well, first I'd like to state that I'm pleased that Paul and I actually agree on three points. Number one, I think Eagle Scouts are fantastic. Um, and I'm glad that you also respect Eagle Scouts. I am an Eagle Scout, by the way. Um, I agree that collaboration is key to any successful project. And I also agree that our city employees deserve much more money than they currently make, including teachers, everyone that works for the city. Um, I've spent my entire life collaborating any of the successes that I've experienced are only as a result of collaboration. It's never just me. It's always in collaboration with whether it's business partners or when I was serving on a board of directors at the YMCA for six years. One of the most important projects from my perspective was Camp Norwich, which I felt was an extremely important piece of the YMCA and very, very family oriented and it was near and dear to me. I grew up uh, around a YMCA in a camp, and I know how rewarding it can be for many families. And it was an extremely controversial issue when I first joined the board. It was uh, probably discussed for a year or two, and there was uh, really no sense of alignment on the issue. And I felt very strongly about it, and through um, many conversations and many different types of collaboration with the 20-plus board members, we passed it. And I know that people that are very close to the issue that served on the board, some of them are here tonight, would probably agree that I was very key and instrumental in pushing that through. So I do believe that collaboration is important. And another piece of collaboration is I'm one of the owners of Northampton Karate. And we have a partnership with the city of Northampton, the rec department, through our children's program. And I think it's been a fantastic example of collaboration because we can't do it alone. And with the rec department's assistance, we've been able to collaborate nicely and build uh, a nice organization. All right, thank you. Yes, I'm going to... Like some questions. Okay. All right, and Mary, I'll come around. Thank you. Okay. We're gonna be here till three in the morning. I know, we have a lot of questions. I hope that's big handwriting. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a few questions about, uh, about, about solid waste. So um, this question goes to Jason first. Uh, is there a better solution to our solid waste disposal than trucking it away? You know, I'm going to be honest and say that I don't have a lot of expertise in solid waste. And... <laughs> Um, one nice thing is my campaign manager has been spearheading solid waste and the management of waste for years in Northampton. And I would certainly defer to his opinion and to the opinion of other experts that have a lot more knowledge than I do about solid waste. I'm sure there are very sensible ways to deal with it more sensibly than what we're currently doing. And um, I believe that, you know, with the right research and with the right information, we can find the right solutions. Thank you. Question to Paul. Yeah, even though I was advised not to touch this and say this, but I'm going to say what's the truth is I don't believe we should have closed the landfill. Um, I really don't. I think the landfill should have stayed open. It produced a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. It was the new one is was far, far safer than the one that we built over. But that being said, uh, what's that, water over the dam or solid waste over something? Um, Actually, I did meet with your campaign manager a few years ago, and we talked about how do we do composting in the city. And um, I think that is something we're still looking into. I think that actually that I agree with Jason, this whole solid waste issue has become, with the landfill closing, has become very difficult. I think the city actually has done a pretty good job in terms of recycling, that we have done a pretty good educational job. We're recycling more and more. What concerns me, if any of you saw an NPR story recently, is that our plastic, when we recycle it, I think it might have been in the Times as well, right now, when we think we're recycling it, we are not. Um, that concerns me that we need to explore where are all of that, you know, the paper is going somewhere and being used, but we need to explore what's happening with that plastic. So in terms of both composting, in terms of other solid waste, I think we're going to need to find some ways of, of dealing with this. 
in fact, one of the things we may be looking at is do we have a citywide um, pickup down the road with a, um, with a vendor who provides much better services in terms of composting and, and recycling. Thank you. Um, short and sweet, Paul. How long have you lived in Ward 2? <clears throat> I have lived, oh, I'm looking at my wife, I think we've lived here 21 years, 21 years. Is that the whole question? I have, do That's I say that? That's the whole question. 20, I've gotten it a 20, couple times. Do I say that for two minutes? We've lived here 20 <laughs> years, 20 years. Um, do, I, do I have more time on that? You have up to two minutes, One if thing you I wish. do want to, let me just say one, no. what's that? Uh, I'll pass it over to Jason okay. and see what he does with that question. I have to completely agree with your answer, Paul. <laughs> yeah. I lived in Ward 2 for two and a half years. I lived in Leeds for three years and Haydenville for five years. And I would, since I have two minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Renewable Energy Park. You know, I think it's really important to have innovative ideas and to create projects that can generate revenue for Northampton. You know, East Hampton has done a nice job with their solar. Hadley's done a nice job with solar. Their estimates, it'll generate about $250,000 a year. But that's because they're renting the land and another developer's coming in to put solar panels on their facilities. What I think we have a really unique opportunity to do is to create financing because the most key piece of this entire puzzle is how do you invest in the infrastructure for renewable energy? How do you create the financing to put the infrastructure in place? And if you can crack that piece of the puzzle, then you can do many things to address the needs of renewable energy and create a revenue stream. And I think that through my experience um, in living in different continents, I've been exposed to different types of corporate structures. And one very popular structure, especially in Asia and in developing countries, is a joint venture model where the city has resources, but they don't have capital. And I think that Northampton could be a great example of we have the resource where Northampton could control 51% of this venture and 49% of the capital can come from, or 100% of the capital for 49% ownership can come from the citizens and local businesses. And it'd be a great opportunity to finance a project of this magnitude. And we can reap all the rewards of the revenue that it generates. It'll eliminate a half a million dollars in expense that the, that the city currently spends on electric, electricity. And at the same time, we can generate a good amount of revenue for the city that is a fantastic community builder, and we could serve as an example to our citizens in how to actually create renewable energy and not just talk about it. And there will be tremendous amounts of roadblocks and issues to overcome, but it starts with the financing. All right, thank you. Um, I've received a couple of questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've received a couple of questions uh, related to, um, to homeless residents. Um, I'm going to try to summarize them into one. Um, what is, uh, what is your, your view about dealing with the issues of the homeless residents in our city? What kinds of services uh, should Northampton provide to the homeless? And, and similarly, how, do, how does the... Um, What's the town's relationship to the homeless and to the panhandlers in the downtown area? And that goes to you first, Jason. Okay. Well, I think it's, um, it's terrible. I think uh, any citizen that is suffering under those conditions should be dealt with compassionately and make sure that they have all the needs that, that they require. So, and I think this is probably in response to the bench removal issue that I think has brought this to the forefront. First, I think there's a few issues to think about. Um, one is the current ordinances. Now, I know I have children, and I've been downtown many times, especially with the panhandler issue, and there are times when there's been profanity and disorderly conduct. And if we were to enforce those issues, I think that that may solve some of the, the issue in terms of what uh, panhandlers do. And that's not all panhandlers, that's just, that's a few. And, I think that enforcing the ordinance that we currently have may help reduce some of the issue. Now, all of this started, my understanding is, because the Business Improvement District felt that they weren't receiving enough support from the city to help their establishments, and that there was a lot of loitering and profanity and disorderly conduct going on. And I think that the city council didn't necessarily address the issue. I commend the mayor for trying. I don't think he had the right solution but I'm not sure that the council actually addressed the issue because 
nothing's really changed. And I think it starts with enforcing our current ordinances and laws, and then looking at other ways to work with homeless to make sure that their needs are met. And there's lots of social organizations that can help with that, and I think that there's volunteer organizations here in North Campton. Um, the Survival Center, I know, does very good work and helps further, you know, the, the, to help homeless people. So I feel like um, we need to really look at how to enforce the ordinances, and then second, how do we support the Business Improvement District to make sure that their needs are met as well. Thank you. Paul, would you Hi. Like um, first, as the chair of the Economic Development Committee, um, which is involved with a lot of the downtown issues, when this first came up, I asked Peg Keller, as the head of housing for us, I said, do we have any kind of surveys that, that have been done to find out who is out on the street? Because there's a lot of rumors about who's there. There's rumors that people, you know, are there and earning, uh, did you hear this one, somebody's earning $50,000 a year out there? I mean, but I, I heard that one. People came in and said that in a public session. So we were trying, yeah, what, do, what are they doing? So we wanted to find out who's there. Are they, you, do they know about the services we have? Do they know about the services and are not using them? Do they know about the services and not using them, and what are their reasons for that? So from that survey work, we find out that there are whole different groups of people there, some of whom know about the services and are not using them, and I'm not sure what we do with that. I agree with Jason. We want to take care of those people. We want to make sure they're educated to know that services are available. One of the other things we can do, and I totally agree, I think that, and this comes all the way back around to budget issues. Back when we had community policing, remember that? When there was that short period of time in this big arc of conservative right-wing government, when we got some funding, I'm looking at the mayor again, when we got some funding from the federal government for community policing, we had a police officer on the street. And it wasn't about enforcement then. It was about, again, building relationships. And you know the problems on, the, on Main Street dropped dramatically. So these problems have been going on they keep cycling around and cycling around. I would like to see that there be a police officer on Main Street. Yes, enforcement would be a piece of that, but building a relationship with the people who are on the street, with the business owners, I think we already know is a proven track record that works. So I think it's some investment the city should make. I've already talked to the police chief about can't we find the funds to do that. So I hope it happens in the future. Thank you. Um, what specific program or project would you add to our budget if it were possible? <sighs> Community policing. <laughs> I would add back a much stronger arts, arts and music program in the schools. I think there's a lot in our schools that we should act, that we should reinforce. I think the fact that we have to ask students and their families to pay for sports, for a lot of the sports things. I think those fees should be cut dramatically. I think we need to reinstate busing. I think we need to add especially to the DPW. I know a lot of people, DPW isn't all that sexy a, you know, a place, but we need to add to the manpower of the DPW. That organization has been cut, that part of city budget has been cut and cut and cut. And we've asked them to do more and more and more. So I know the frustration when many of you call. Now, I, I have a policy that if a constituent calls, I respond within 48 hours. I then take that. I will go to the DPW especially because usually your calls are about signage or potholes or other issues like that. And the DPW then has a lengthy list, and you get frustrated with me, and I get frustrated with them. So I would reinstate, put, get a lot more manpower at the DPW so that when you call me up, I could say someone will be out there tomorrow morning. Um, how much more time do I have? I'll go into a lot of other areas. Let me just say, I want to respond to a couple of other things because I agree with Jason about solar. We are going to put solar up on the landfill. How we finance that, this is an area, and I'm looking at my wife because she knows that she's gone, God, he spends so much time on this. I've been looking at how do you get solar on public, in public places and on nonprofit buildings, we actually went to the Y and tried to work out the financing because the major reason that solar right now is financially viable on houses is because you get the tax break. You get the state and federal tax break. When you don't get that, it makes it very difficult. Everybody is looking at how you do this financing. Believe me, it is all, everybody is looking for how you do this. Thank you, Paul. Jason, what pro specific program or project would you add to our budget if possible? 
Well, first, I agree with Paul that I think education is key. I would like to give as much money as we possibly can to our schools to reinstate the arts, sports, other programs. But I also look at, it's not so much about what I think, it's what I think the constituents in the ward think. And I can tell you the most common concerns, it relates to our quality of life. It has to deal with paving our roads, filling our potholes, fixing the cracks in our sidewalk. These are the things that affect every citizen in Northampton. And these are the things that I think have been neglected for many years because of funding. So if we had extra funding, these would be great ways to improve the quality of life for everyone, and not just a few people. Reducing speed. I think that signs would go a long way, whether it's parking signs, no parking signs. There's just a lot of small things that affect our quality of life that the residents in Ward 2 have felt neglected over the past 10 years. And I think that we should put a lot of money towards preserving as much green space as we possibly can, because we're all here for the quality of life. And the minute we start putting more development on the green space, I think we're diminishing some of our quality of life. And that's what I would do with the spending. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, I have I have some since, since you're applying for the job of city councilor, I have some job related questions here. Um, could you speak to your qualifications to uh, to represent Ward Two on the city council, and also what do you feel is will be your would be your largest challenge? I think the well, first I think the largest challenge is to make sure that you know all of the concerns of the constituents in the ward. I feel that the role of a city councilor is to advocate with vigor for their constituents. And we're here to represent. That's why we're running especially for a specific ward. And in this case, it's Ward 2. So I feel like my job as a city councilor would be to make sure that all of the concerns of the citizens in the ward are addressed. Sorry, could you repeat the other part of the question? And what qualifications do you ah. bring to the job? So again, I believe that uh, this goes back to the collaboration issue, and I think it also goes back to the experience that I have. And I feel like, as, in terms of qualification, one of the greatest assets that I have is my business experience, because I believe that that is an asset that the, the city council currently lacks. And I, and I feel as long as we have um, less than we should in terms of understanding of finances, understanding of how businesses run, understanding how to create sustainable revenue, understanding how to read a profit and loss statement, we will continue to have um, this reactionary cycle of budget cuts and overrides. I feel like one thing that business has taught me is you need to be very proactive. And I think that that's one thing that a city councilor should be is very proactive and not reactive to everything. So I feel that in terms of qualification, I've had 20 years of building different successful collaborations with individuals, with committees, with governments, with organizations, and with businesses. And I think that that alone is um, a great track record to bring to city council. Thank you. Paul, what are your qualifications and what do you feel would be your biggest <clears throat> challenge? A little different than Jason since I've been in the job. I think my qualifications are how have I done on the job. And I think one of the ways you evaluate that is what are your colleagues say about you. I mean, that's one way of looking at, a, at how somebody's doing. And I think the reason why I think it's every counselor is supporting me for re-election is because I've earned their trust. There are counselors there who we have a lot of disagreements with, but I've earned their trust and in in their respect in terms of working together with them. I think also the fact that I have the, the trust of the, of the mayor, the current mayor, and the trust of the president of the council, I think, is incredibly important and speaks to my qualifications. I just want to go to a couple of things because it is understanding finances. So the city streets, 90% of our money for city streets comes from the state. So it's state funding that does that. So it's the state that even has to get more money. I know I'm getting a little into the weeds, but if we just got more money as the city, it's the state that gives us that money. In addition, um, Jason mentioned open space. The one thing I think this city has done in the last 10 years, if you look at what we have done, and maybe even it was back when Mary Ford was mayor and Fran Volkman was counselor, I think we've done an amazing job in difficult times of preserving open space. I mean, you, we, and, and we have leveraged the way we've done that by the planning department that's been incredible. For every dollar we've spent, we have leveraged four other dollars. 
The Community Preservation Act, which is something that you encouraged me, as I said before, to get in place, has been incredibly important. And that act, too, for every dollar that we put into the Community Preservation Act for open space, we've gotten $4 back. Now, to me, that's really understanding how money works. And I think we've done a great job, both at Turkey Hill, at Fitzgerald Lake, at a whole number of places where we have preserved, we have a vision of having, I think it's 30% is our vision, and we've come very close to that in terms of preserving open space throughout the city. Okay. Thank you. Um, you just touched on it, but I'm gonna, but I have questions about uh, both what your stances are um, on, related to the Community Preservation Act and also the Business Improvement District. And what are you, are those things that you support or those things you would like to see changes made to? Are, are you asking and both goes, of those at once? I am <laughs> asking both okay. of those and at it's once. Me. Okay. And it goes so, to you first. Business Improvement District, I supported it. So just so getting into the weeds of this, what is a business improvement district? This is one area where the state says, okay, if you're in a certain area and you want to tax yourself, a, a commercial area, you want to tax yourself and you can get enough people in that area a per certain percentage, you can tax yourself and have a business improvement district to do things like clean the streets, put flowers out like they're doing, do some advertising. So when a group of business owners on Main Street showed us that they could get, reach that threshold, which is a majority in that area, I said, why not, and supported it strongly, and I still do. The Community Preservation Act, if anybody said to me, what's the single thing as a counselor in the 10 years that I'm proudest of, and I think 30 years from now when I'm in the nursing home, I'm going to say that may have been one of the best things in my life. I spearheaded the Community Preservation Act. I think it is totally aligned with our values. It's also aligned with the fact that folks here are not tea partiers. When government works well, you are willing to pay for it. And that's something, because the values of that are so important, again, it's open space, recreational space, historic preservation. And finally, something that in this ward, I and this city has valued, which is that we should have economic diversity as we go forward. It'd be very easy for us to become kind of another, I guess the term yuppie isn't around anymore, but a yuppie town. I don't think that's part of the value here. So part of that money in the Community Preservation Act goes to affordable housing. So in terms of the Community Preservation Act, each time people talk about threatening it, whether I'm on the city council or not, I'm going to be fighting to keep it. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I do disagree with a few points that, that Paul's made. First, I think the most important piece of any city councilor is not what the other councilors think of that person. It's what their constituents think and how we represent our constituents because that's who we're interviewing for the job for. It's not for other city councilors. And if our finances have been so great, why have we needed constant overrides? And I think that that negates some of the financial understanding that's on city council currently. In terms of economic diversity, I think it's wonderful. I think as many people um, as possibly can should enjoy the quality of life that we're all here for in Northampton. And I think that, you know, that also goes along with affordable housing. I just have a couple questions surrounding um, how much more affordable housing or how much more housing in general that we put um, on our land. And part of my questions are, I'm just, I feel like there's some confusion. My sense is the goal is for the city to increase their tax base, which I think is commendable. Obviously you do that with the more units you have. However, when you look at the population 100 years ago, it was 29,000. In 1940, 29,000. 1970, 29,000. Today, 29,000. We have unsuccessfully increased our population in the past 100 years. I'm not sure where we're going to be attracting more people, but we haven't done it in 100 years, and I'm concerned that we may build more housing and more housing, and it's not gonna be filled. We have a 5% unoccupied rate right now as it is. I'm also concerned that the average family, uh, the average household in Northampton has 1.3 children that comes at a cost to educate those children. So if we're not thinking through all of the issues that relate to having more people in our city, we may end up in a net deficit rather than a net positive from the tax because the cost to, to school a child is $11,600 a year. And this is all posted on Northampton's website. Oh, I'm out of time. Okay, thank you. Um, do you feel that there should be term limits for city council? 
Why or why not? That goes to you first, Jason. Well, I think this is a little unfair and biased of me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it should be at uh, 10 years, perhaps. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I actually do think there should be term limits. Because, uh, f well, first of all, there's a reason why it's a two-year term. And I'm guessing it's because the point of a city councilor is to contribute as much as they can in a certain amount of period, certain amount of time, and then move on. And I think that once you've been in a role for a certain amount of time, and this, is, this was true with me and any businesses that I've been involved with or owned, it was any time you have new, fresh perspective, you'll always have some kind of enhanced value from that individual. And I feel like the same is true with city councilors. I don't anticipate doing this for life or for 10 years or for 12 years or for even eight years. I want to serve and contribute what I can to make a difference in this community. And I believe that it should be a two-year term. And I'm not sure why people feel that they should be in the position longer, but it seems like there's a reason why we've um, intentionally created a two-year term. I believe we do have term limits. They're called elections. I've never been for term limits. We see what happens in other places where they put them in effect, like California and other places. So I believe experience is important. And I do not plan, plan to be here for life because I, too, see this as like serving on a nonprofit board. I feel like it's a contribution to the community, and there will be a time not too far in the distant future when I want to do other things. I want to go back to a couple of things because it may be a place where Jason and I disagree, which would be great. We can have more discussion after this. One of the things I love about being the counselor at this ward, on this ward, is Ward 2. There's a joke about Ward 2 in City Hall. The joke is that Ward 2 residents are interested in the NSA surveillance, drone strikes, and parking. <laughs> and, and the truth of that joke is something I've appreciated in the last 10 years. The people in this ward understand that outside forces of the federal government affect us very directly and very potently. So that a right, we have had a swing for the last 30 something years on a federal level that cuts our budget the things we value over and over and over again. It cuts money to the state. This is where the rubber has hit the road. It's right here in the ward. And so I think that understanding is incredibly important because one of the things that then starts to happen, and, and this, isn't, this is by design, what starts to happen is we start fighting with each other over limited resources. And unless we diagnose this problem correctly, Unless we understand where is the essence and origin of this problem, we are going to do that. We will fight for the limited resources for communities. So we'll be fighting for Cole Morgan to stay here, or Coca-Cola, and someone else will be. And we will be fighting with each other and blaming our leaders. I actually think we've done an incredible job the last 10 years. I think we have been really lucky to have the former mayor and the current mayor. I think we are very lucky to keep the department heads we have at the salaries they have. So I just wanted to make sure I said that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, wow, how long are we going? It takes I three. know, I know. I think, uh, I think this is gonna be our last yeah. question from the audience and then we'll be moving on to closing, closing statements. So, um, Let's see, this one goes to you first, Paul, correct? <laughs> um, when, uh, when development projects are proposed or already underway, do you have ideas for inviting and incorporating resident and neighbor input? Yeah, actually, let, let's even go to one in Jason's neighborhood, Round Hill, because even before, I think before you came there, I went to multiple meetings with folks in the neighborhood, multiple meetings at Clark School. I, I looked, and I think it was something like 12 meetings I went to even before. And what I try to ask the neighbors, and I think Jason is right, that the, the residents' response of how I'm doing is really important. I went to the neighbors and I said, look, it's not about my ideas at all. It's about what are the key things you want from this developer? And we didn't even know who the developer was. So I tried to facilitate a process to say, here's what we want. We want to make sure there are, so just the specifics, a certain number of, here's the amount of people we want there. I think it was 90 units. We want to make sure that the footprint stays in place as much as possible. We want to make sure that as few trees are as down as possible. So when the OPAL proposal came through and met all of those things, the group I met with said, 
this looks like the one we want to run with. Now let's watch what's happening. Now I've gone to meeting after meeting after meeting about this and we'll be at a lot more. We were just at one last week together. I think it was the second one I've seen you at and we had a good meeting on the street. And we were right there literally on the street, by the way, for the meeting. I will go to every possible meeting I can to make sure that we continue that development and we, we continue to look at how that developer is doing his job. So I think that, going back to your question, I think that's the way you work as a city councilor. I've also done that just tonight. I went to a meeting at Village Hill. So Village Hill is the other big residential development area. That I've gone to many meetings up at Village Hill to watch how that project is going, to talk to the residents there about what are their concerns, what are their needs. I will continue to do that at Round Hill. I'll continue to do that at Village Hill. The main place, by the way, where we increase our tax base is not by increasing the population. It's commercial development. Because with commercial development, as Jason said, we don't educate the kids of those businesses. We don't have to pay those expenses. And Jason, you want me to repeat the question? Sure. OK. <laughs> uh, when development projects are proposed or already underway, do you have ideas for inviting and incorporating resident and neighbor input? Yes, I think um, I think it'd be very. Imp I mean, obviously, I'm affected as are my immediate neighbors, as are everybody that lives up at Village Hill, people that deal with Smith College or the YMCA. I think it's extremely important. I, th I think that's the primary role of a city councilor is to make sure you're incorporating feedback of the citizens in your ward. And one idea I have is, I believe it would be advantageous to subdivide the ward into, let's say, 11 different smaller neighborhood areas and create a team of, let's say, neighborhood leaders that we have quarterly meetings with so that they can provide input that's important to their smaller neighborhoods and that I can provide input as a city councilor and incorporate all their feedback into all of the agenda that they'd like to see me promote in front of city hall, uh, to city council. And I feel like one of the key pieces to this is to have ongoing communication and organized input. And the best way to do it is to have different leaders from each of the neighborhoods represented so that they can discuss what's important in each of the local neighborhoods. Because Paul's right, every neighborhood will have slightly different issues, although there are some common threads. And you know, the meeting that we did have the other day, literally on the road, is we were watching them tear up speed bumps that many of the abutting neighbors of Round Hill Road didn't want. And this, I think, is a, a perfect example of why um, one of the reasons why I'm running is because I haven't felt that our voices have been heard. And we had discussed not putting new speed bumps up. And the next day, new speed bumps were there. We don't want speed bumps, and other areas want speed bumps, and somehow we ended up having them, as if our voices weren't heard at all. So I do feel that it's extremely important to have input from the neighbors. And the reason I uh, chose 11 instead of an even number is because you want this to be a very democratic process so we can vote on you know, what the best moves are for the city council and a representation and be a very strong voice and advocate for the citizens. All right. Thank you. Um, that concludes our audience questions. Uh, we have brief closing statements from each candidate. Um, Paul, you. We're designated to go first in your closing Great. statement, and then Jason will make his. How brief is this? Two minutes. Oh, two minutes, thank you. Well, first I want to thank the League for sponsoring this. I want to thank uh, Community Television for being here and putting it on. I want to thank, uh, I think it's the Republic, sent a reporter. I want to thank my wife for showing up at this. She knows more now about city government than she ever thought she would, and probably way more than she wants to know. So thank you, Jane, for all your support during, during these years. I really have loved being your city councilor, and actually, I feel like I've been growing into this job. I know by 10 years I should have uh, outgrown it maybe, but each time I just um, learn more, and I've really loved being your counselor. Many of you come up to me. Somebody came up to me just tonight. I'd already written this, but they came up to me tonight. They said, why do you want to do this? I mean, the interminable meetings. How do you stand the meetings? And people just complain. All they do is look at what's wrong. It's not even the cup half full. Somebody said to me, ain't the cup half full? Cup is like 5% full. We live in a great city. And cup, how do you do it? And it's a thankless job. Well, you know what? The last part's not true. It is not a thankless job. 
you guys have thanked me over and over and over again. I went to a meeting tonight at Village Hill. Everybody was thanking me. And it's that thanks and that support which keeps me going. And I want to keep doing it as long as I get that thanks and as long as I'm really interested in the job, which may not be that much longer. But with that said, I see this as kind of serving as many of you do. I look around, I see many of you serve on nonprofit boards. It's because you believe in the mission of the organization. I love this city, and I love this ward. When we moved to this ward 20 years ago, my friend said, and on Massasoit Street, they said, you've moved to Sesame Street. <laughs> well, we've lived in Sesame Street during stormy times. I would love to be your counselor as things get better. I'd love to sail the ship when there's a little bit of sunny skies. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Jason. <clears throat> Our roads are a mess. Potholes resemble craters, and the cracks in our sidewalks are simply dangerous. It boils down to priorities and money. By far, the most common concern across the ward, speeding. It's not polarizing partisan politics or the use of drones. It's speeding. Slowing vehicles doesn't require money. It takes prioritization, follow-up, heightened awareness, and strong leadership. I intend to preserve our quality of life and represent neighbors dealing with developments at Village Hill, Round Hill Road, Smith College, and the YMCA. Ongoing communication and organized input is key. We don't need to settle on mediocrity. We can do better. It's time to align our representation with the follow-through experience and drive that is required. Elect someone who takes the time to understand what matters most to the residents of Ward 2. Elect me. I have revenue-generating ideas, unique outside-of-the-box thinking, and the tenacity to drive projects from concept to completion. Our city council should include people with diverse perspectives and skills to meet the needs of a city with growing populations, growing families, and strange budgets. Our council lacks this diversity. I bring new skills, new energy, and new perspectives. My opponent is a good person who's dedicated 10 years to public service. He's run unopposed for many elections and filled the role on our behalf. We owe him a huge debt of gratitude. Many people would shy away from trying to de-seat a 10-year incumbent, but I believe it's time for change. Rather than complain, I decided to be proactive and run for public office. I'm willing to advocate for priorities and improvements. I've made a career of implementing ideas, pursuing successful ventures. Can I go for another minute? 30 seconds? Finish your sentence, Thank please, you. yes. <laughs> We're here for the quality of life, and that's where our focus should be. I look forward to serving as city councilor, and I'd like to encourage you to vote Jason Foster and make a difference. Thank you for your time and consideration, and thank you, Isaac, for your support. All right. Please join me in clapping for our two candidates. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's a really wonderful thing when people are willing to engage in local government and to share their views with people. Um, this concludes uh, the formal portion of this evening. Um, we I, thank you to NCTV for being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters volunteers. If there are audience members who would like to speak informally with the candidates, we'll be coming down around at the base of this stage, and you may ask questions um, without the cameras and all the formality. So um, thank you again for coming, and uh, get out and vote, please. <laughs>